Well, we, are, uh, we were in a series called It's Complicated. We're going back next week. Today, we're going to get that next week. I just feel like I was, I was all the way done with the sermon, ready to roll, and I'm really excited about it. It's going to be, I think it's powerful, uh, really a key to almost every relationship. We're going to be closing our series out next week. But as I saw what was unfolding before our eyes, it, it was just alarming. And, uh, and I just, I don't know about you, but it really broke my heart. Um, you know, I, I, it really broke my heart, and I couldn't sleep at night over this whole thing. And, you know, I had uncles that fought in World War II. I had uncles that talked about the atrocities of the Nazis. You know, I've, I've talked to people that were, un, that were in concentration camps and, and, and during Hitler's reign. I, I mean, I've talked to people. I'm old enough, I'm old enough to, to know some of these people. And so everybody, you know, I, I just, I really believe very strongly that we need to be a people that pray. We need to pray for our country as well, okay? But today, uh, I'm going to talk about this, overcoming the anxiety of the unknown. I mean, when you see stuff going like today, when you start seeing all the actions taking place, when you start seeing um, Iran about ready to get a nuclear missile, you know, when you see, um, you see Russia doing what they're doing, and it makes no sense for them to do what they're doing. It makes no political sense. It's going to hurt his economy. It's going to hurt people in Russia. It's going to hurt. So it just shows you that this man is in a dictator mindset and akin to what has happened uh, back in 1938 where uh, Hitler went, as I mentioned earlier, I think I mentioned it earlier sometimes. Did I mention that already? I did. Okay, I won't go there again. Sometimes the services run together, and I just don't know. But, you know, just want to let you know about that. But anyhow, back to this. But how, how about the unknown? Is this the end? Is this like we hear about Russia, we hear about Iran and all that, and if you look at Ezekiel 38, it talks about Gog and Magog. You look, oh, my gosh, is this what's happening? Is God going to come back? Is this the World War III? Is the Antichrist going to come right now? I mean, we just barely pulling out of this COVID thing, right? Finally, we're, coming, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Like, oh, praise God. I don't know about you, but two years ago, when I remember they said, you're going to have to lock down. Remember that? Yeah. It was like two years ago almost. I don't know about you, but I had a sense of dread. There was, like a, there was like this anxiety in my chest. It was bothering me. I'm like, God, I can't allow this to happen. And I'm, I'm glad because what it did is it helped me go after God. Well, when I hear about what's going on in Russia, it's almost the same feeling all over again. I'm like, God, we just get, God, can you just give us a break for a little bit, Lord? We're just pulling out of this thing. And so there's anxiety, and so maybe this is for me, but I think a lot of you maybe are looking at current events and, and you're pretty anxious, or maybe the current event of maybe losing your job. Uh, the current event of maybe someone you love has cancer. Maybe the current event that you're involved with something that's so bad, if anyone ever knew, they would divorce you, or they would not like you, and you're living with this, and you had this on your back, and you, you have this anxiety of the unknown. What's going to happen, God? I'm graduating high school. Should I go into, what field should I go into? God, I'm, my kids are out of the house. What's next? God, should we move here, move there? God, what are you calling me to do? I don't know what to do. I'm losing my job. And all these things come in us. God, the friends I thought I had have left me, and I'm, I'm by myself now again in the lunchroom. And I don't have any friends, God. What's going to happen to me? I thought this person was going to be my husband or wife. Or, and you go through all these things, overcoming the anxiety of the unknown. How do we overcome the anxiety of the unknown? So these are things we're going through. And I, you know, this is Ukraine. We want to pray for Ukraine. I talked about it enough already, but I want to encourage you to pray for Ukraine. Pray for the people. Pray for those leaders over there and pray that God would move powerfully. And that God would work through this situation. But you look at all this. And what would happen if, you know, China, for example. China, it's no accident. I'm just telling you about some current events that are going on. Now, by the way, the Bible should always be in, in, intersected in current events. But let me just say something very important. What we do not need to do, however, is try to force the glass slipper of prophecy on current events. Like Cinderella's stepsisters that try to get that shoe on there, Right? And sometimes I've seen people try to, this is the end, this is the, I'm not saying it's the end. But could it be that God is, the ax is being laid at the root of the trees? Could it be like me trying to put a picture up in my house, which is a bad thing? Uh, there's been times I just took a nail and bang, and it messed up the, the wall. I learned from my wife <laughs> that you got to get a nail, and you tap it just a little bit, and you make a little mark, an indentation. Then you can go away and say, could it be that what we have right now is some marking what's going to happen in the future? I don't know. 
But how do we handle these various things? So, to know the unknown will of God, focus on the known will of God. And this applies to everything. Maybe you don't know what God's going to do in your, in your family, in your relationship, with the doctor's report. I don't know what it is. I, God, I don't know what you want me to do. And what I want to encourage you to do is focus on the known will of God will lead you to the unknown will of God in your heart. And we have the Bible. Thank God for the Bible, which is a light into our path. The Bible says, I've hated in his word in my heart that I may not go off and sin. And so to know the unknown will of God, focus on the known will of God. Now, what is that all about? Well, Jesus actually tells us a little about the end times. This is what we're going to do in the limited time we have here today. This is what we're going to do. We're going to look at what Jesus has to say, kind of a macro view of the end times, just a little bit, and then we're going to go to some exercises and things that you and I can do to, to navigate anxiety and to deal with it in a way that's biblical and powerful, okay? That's where we're going. So first of all, let's just see what Jesus has to say about these end times. And, and by the way, he puts a little bit of some criteria that have to, there's certain benchmarks that has to be hit before he comes back, by the way. But let's look at it. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, okay? He's sitting on the Mount of Olives. Uh, one day his disciples said, look at all these great uh, buildings. He says, no, you see all these buildings? It's all going to be torn apart. In 70 AD, the Rome, Rome, Rome came in and had enough of the Jewish rebellion and wiped out the temple and, and turned everything over. So Jesus prophesies about that, and then he prophesies about what's going to come at the end of the age. And that's the problem with Scripture sometimes. And many, many times Scripture will give prophetic um, highlights what's going to happen, but it doesn't tell you the time span in between. And that's found here as well. So as he sat on the Mount of Olives, which right across from Jerusalem, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus said, watch CNN. I'm sorry, you didn't say that. <laughs> and Jesus said, answered them, see that no one leads you astray. Now, why would Jesus say that you, you could be led astray? Because you can be? Thank you. And when you're led astray, you don't know you're astray. That's why you're astray. Write that down and tweet that one. Okay. <laughs> See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. It's been happening for millennia. And they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Right? We're hearing of that more and more. See that you're not alarmed. But God, I'm freaking, hang out. See not your alarm, for this must take place. See, one of the reasons we get rid of anxiety is this is not heaven, everybody. I don't like to, I don't like to be hot and sweaty. I just don't. That's why I like this winter. I love the winter. I hope it never leaves. I do. I like it. You don't have to cut the grass. There's no bugs. Praise the Lord. That alone is enough for me. You don't have to take showers three times a day. But, you know, when I went to Haiti and different places, Indonesia, and I went to India, uh, I recognized I was going to a third world country, and I recognized the fact they don't have air conditioning. And I recognized the fact that I'm going to sweat, I'm going to be sweaty. So guess what? I knew what to expect. So when it happened, I wasn't freaking out. But when I'm in the United States and there's no air conditioning, I turn into a Karen. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? When you expect something happening wrong, when, when, you, when you understand anything's not perfect, you're not going to be surprised. Jesus says very clearly, in this world, you're going to have trouble. So this is not heaven yet, everybody. The reason why you don't feel at home, because you're not at home. Amen. This is not heaven. We are going to go through difficult times. So lower your standards and higher your standards at the same time. Higher your standards to heaven and lower your standards of earth. All right? So see that no one, that you're not, you're alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against na um, kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. In the parallel passage, it says there'll be pestilence, which is like plagues. You think this last year was, yeah, that was a plague. All these are but the beginning. What are you kidding, God? Yeah. All these are just but the beginning of the birth pangs. Now, I never got pregnant, but my wife did. And I've noticed what happens. When you have your first child, you have no idea 
If she, if, she has, if she has indigestion, I'm running to the hospital. If she sneezes, I'm running to the hospital. Their baby's coming. You know, I'm just freaking out. And, uh, and so that's what happened. And, uh, and so Luke was our firstborn, and every day I had a birthday. Is this it? Is this it? And then we found out, no, no, let's call Braxton Hick, Braxton Hick, whoever this guy Braxton Hicks is. I'd like to meet him. <laughs> Why did they name it after a guy when a woman goes through pain? That's not right. Anyhow, so uh, we'd have these Braxton hits, things happen, and then we'd have these uh, contractions. And what happened, the closer it was to the birth of our son, the baby, the more violent the contractions get, from my understanding. Right, honey? Am I correct? Let me just say, tell you the truth. If I had to have a baby, there'd be no babies. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a wimp. Uh, goldfish is enough for me. I can't imagine having a baby. Anyhow, so, so what happened was as, as the uh, contractions came more violent, that you know the time was coming. Well, that's what Jesus is saying. All these are but the beginning of the birth pangs, but they will deliver you to tribulation, difficulty, suffering, torturing, killing, and put you to death. And you'll be hated. Hello, everybody. You're going to be hated. But everyone's supposed to love me. Not everyone's going to love you. Now, don't be a jerk so they hate you. But if you're standing up for Jesus Christ and doing the right thing, they're going to hate you. There's a supernatural, demonic hatred of people of God. It's happening all around the world. I mean, you can see the hatred toward Jewish people. It makes no cognitive sense. Why is there such hatred of Christianity? Once you mention Jesus, you're in trouble. People don't like it, right? Deliver you into tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations, and nations is ethnic, means all people, for my name's sake. And then many will fall away. Who? Christians. Uh, I'm reading all the time. This artist fell away. He's renouncing his faith. This guy's renouncing his faith. I mean, everyone's freaking out in the articles. What's happening to the Christian faith? I'm reading these publications from Christian magazines. Well, I can't believe that Jars of Clay guy said this, and this person said this, and the guy from DC Talk, and but this, this philosopher left. That, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? I'm like, well, the Bible says, and many will fall away. Hello, that's what's going to happen. Don't be surprised. Jesus had 12, and one fell away. Okay? And then many will fall away and betray one another. And what? Hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. We've been seeing that happening. And because, this is the part that scares me, and because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. When you're so absorbed, I'm not, I'm, listen, I, I'm a big fan of these, but if you get so absorbed in this thing, all about me, 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 narcissism, this is a, this is a delicacy of narcissism. You can sit in your own little orbit and put those buds on. No one knows what's going on. I'm in a different world. Listen, it's okay. I like doing it too, and I'm, I understand that. But I can get to the point where you can make your own silo, and when the algorithms will just give you advertisements and news stories to fit your appetite. And you can be sitting there by yourself in a cage, a cage of, of conformity to this planet, and you just sit there, and you're just drunk on the world. It's okay to use this, but the gluttony of this is not good. And it's happened to me. I'm sitting there... Oh my, and I don't have time to pray. Yeah, right, Lord, I'm sorry. But this is what happens. And so we can, put our, we can put our heads in the sand and not know what's going on in the world, not praying for the world. We don't care what's going on. And our love grows cold and lawlessness. And lawlessness is doing the wrong thing. When you continue to do the wrong thing, your heart grows cold. And when your heart grows cold, you don't care about truth. You don't care about right. And sin begins to happen. So many's hearts will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Who's saved? The one endures to the end. What about pre? I'm not going to talk about that today, but the Bible says that. And now this is the part I want you to understand, and we're going to get to the other part, okay? And this gospel, which is the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed or preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And again, that Greek word is ethnos, which is people groups. It's not a geographical border only. It's people groups. If I drew a circle around this church on a map in a 20-mile radius, there's people of different ethne right here. There's Afghanistan, Af Afghans, there's Pakistanis, there's Iranians, there's Germans. Yeah, I mean, there's all sides of people living, and some of them are tight-knit groups and are not quite integrated yet, and that's what happens. And so the Bible says, as a testimony of all nations, all ethnes, and then the end will come. So the gospel has to go to the whole earth first, then Christ comes back. So I know he's not going to come back yet. 
for the final. What about post mid training? I don't know. We'll get to that next week. Approximately right now, there's 7.75 billion people in the world. According to what I read recently, as of this year, estimates that 3.23 billion of them live in unreached people groups with little or no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's about 3 billion people that have not had an opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. And so the truth is, every day we're translating the Bible. And thanks, thanks to God from technology, we're able to translate Scripture very, very quickly and go into unreached people groups. There's something called the 1040 window, which is basically northern Africa, stretches across from northern Africa to, uh, through India, all the way to Indonesia, and all that Asian part of the world is an area that is dark to the gospel in many ways. And so I believe, and according to Jesus, this gospel shall be preached, then the end will come. It's happening at an exponential rate. People are coming to know Christ, and the gospel is being preached like never before. So it could happen in our lifetime. Okay? So this is what begins to happen. So we believe that this gospel will first be preached, then the end will come. Then he goes on and says this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened from global warming. I'm sorry. The sun will be darkened. It will be from global warming, by the way. A lot of explosions. And the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's what Jesus says. Heaven and earth will pass away. Let me ask you a question. If you build your life on this earth, but what you accomplish, what you can do. Think about, think about those um, Ukrainians who left everything behind and ran to Poland and the surrounding nations. Everything that we are so concerned about means nothing in the end. All that matters is God, your family, and the people that God has put around you. Heaven and earth will pass away. So if you're building on your life on earth, why are you going to build your life on something that's going to pass away? Okay, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So what we need to do is we need to believe the reality of the word of God more of the current temporary reality of this planet because the reality of the word supersedes the temporary conditions here on earth. And we have to keep our hearts and our minds ahead to what's true. Jesus says this, but concerning that day, no one knows except for a pastor in Texas. Okay, no one, okay, when the Bible says no one knows, what does it mean? Okay, no one knows. Now, he even gets more specific here because he knew this would be happening. He says, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son. And he says, I don't even know. So I'm sure Jesus is folding on his arms in heaven. Uh, God, you didn't tell me that, 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 that pastor, and the reason I'm saying pastor in Texas, because Texas has a lot of churches. Okay, I didn't know that, God, right? Nor the Son, but only the Father knows. We know the signs of the times. We know the birth pangs are happening, but we don't know the exact time. I do believe, however, that the gospel yet has not been preached to the whole planet yet. And the Bible says that Jerusalem will be tread under the feet of the Gentiles until the end time comes. So guess what happened in 1948? Very significant. When Israel became a nation, that was very significant. In 1967, they captured Jerusalem again. Very significant. The parts are lining up, everybody. The axe has been laid at the root of the trees. We can see that, that, that things are being set up for the end. I believe that. And it can happen very, very quickly. So what are we to do in all this? Are we going to World War III? You know, I think of my grandparents. Unbelievable what they went through. My grandfather, for example, was born in 1898. My other grandfather was born in 1865. <laughs> yeah, I'm, are you that old? Well, anyhow, let's just move on. Um, but my grandfather was born in 18, uh, 1898 in Germany, and so he grew up in Germany, and, and he actually fought uh, for Germany in World War I. Can you imagine that? The chemical weapons, the whole thing. He got through that one. Then he faced a Great Depression in Germany, because after World War I, the whole world was against Germany, which set up, the, set up a condition for a dictator to use the hurts of the... Anyhow, that's another point. So what happened was they were going through great difficulty. Then... Then they went through the Spanish flu. World War I, a depression in Germany, influenza. Then he comes to the United States thinking, this is great. I'll get out of this. And then 1929 happens. And we, grow, we fall into the Great Depression in the United States. Then he's, just, he's climbing out of that 
Then comes World War II, and Hitler is the, is the culprit, and they speak German. So now he's afraid to teach my mother German. So you see, they went through a lot of difficulty. And boy, they were tough as nails. We haven't gone through anything, really. Think about it. What we've gone through, I got slow internet. I mean, that's basically our problems right now. Right? I don't have 5G. Uh. So this is what begins to happen. So what are we to do? Listen, everybody, difficult times will come. This is called the planet Earth. This is not heaven yet. How are we going to handle the anxiety? I'll be honest. I, I was struggling. To, I'm struggling right now a little bit. I'm like, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but something inside me is rising up. I want to make a difference. And so what are we to do? Well, this is what Jesus says. These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. It's an invitation for peace. In the world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome. The cheer means very, very happy. Party type. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the earth. That's why you'll hear me say time and time again, the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. The best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. Why? The best is yet to come. This is not heaven. That's why you're not satisfied. Heaven, you are made for God and you are made for eternity. This is a temporary birthing process. You are birthing into eternity. This is gestation to eternity. So, overcoming the anxiety of the known, unknown. How do we do that? We're going to have to go a little quicker here. Okay, this is the first one. Listen and practice the word of God, scripture. Let God's word fill your heart. I cannot tell you progressively, I, Pastor, you always talk about this. Yes, because the single most important thing I do, the top two or three things I do every day is reading the word of God. Nothing else has shaped me more than getting into the word of God and letting the Holy Spirit shape me. Amen. I'm telling you progressively. You can come here, we can lay hands on, you can go out in the spirit, you can, you can levitate around the room, you can have, see angels and all that, but if you don't read your Bible every day, you're not gonna go anywhere. I'm telling you, listen and practice the word of God, scripture. Also, what does the Bible say about anxiety? <laughs> well, it has a lot to say about anxiety, by the way, yeah. And let me just let you off the hook. If you're struggling with anxiety and you're in medication, you're not a bad Christian, if you struggle with depression, you're not a bad Christian. I understand there are medical conditions like high blood pressure and other things that can cause you duress. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about generalized. Okay? However, these in things that we're talking about here could literally make you better and I believe even heal you. But don't put guilt on yourself. Is that clear, everybody? I'm so tired of people doing that. Okay? Don't let the enemy whisper in your ear. You're not a bad person. It's like people that have high blood pressure are not bad people. But having salt and hot dogs doesn't help either. Okay? Just saying that because the summary is coming, by the way, to my demise. Okay. So what does the word of God say? What does the word of God say? Be anxious. Praise the Lord. I can actually do something the Bible says. It says, the Bible says, be anxious. No, it doesn't. It says this. Ah. <laughs> be anxious for nothing. You know what nothing means in the Greek? Not a thing. Be anxious for nothing. Well, great. I've already blown it. Listen, everybody. I understand. I totally get it. I totally get it. I remember one time getting a phone call from the doctor. I was on vacation. Oh, by the way, yeah, we found melanoma on your back. <laughs> yeah, I, all of a sudden, it's like someone threw me in a pool of fear. I felt it. Oh, my God, what's going to happen? Bah, 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 bah. I'm like, wait, in Jesus' name. Father, thank you. And I had to swim out of it with faith. Anyhow, be anxious for nothing. You know what I'm talking about, people, right? Yeah. Be anxious for nothing. But in some things... Everything. What does everything mean? Everything. And everything by prayer and supplication. What's supplication? That means telling God what's going on in your life. God wants you to talk to him. You know, you can pay and spend $250 to talk to a psychologist for 35 minutes. And all they do is like this. And they used to smoke a pipe, but not anymore. They said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, thank you so much. I feel better. You know, how about telling God? You know, so many times, I like getting here by myself, by the way, and, and, uh, and that's, I like to get by myself in this church or someplace, and I just talk to God. I just, I have it out with him. God, what's going on? And I'll talk to him, I'll pray, whatever works for you, okay? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. So tell him how you feel. God, I feel, I, I'm, I'm afraid of what's going to happen. God, what's going to happen to my kids? What happens if my kids get drafted and go over to the Middle East or something and fight against what's going on in the world? What happens if I lose my child? This is just going through my mind, by the way. And this is what happens. So, worry about nothing, pray about everything. That's what we're called to do. 
Be anxious for what? Nothing. And but and everything by prayer. So basically the first point is this. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Okay? Pray about everything. Everything. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Now, who wrote this was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was under a lot worse quarantine than you and I ever were. He was in prison and had guards watching him. Hardly a situation to be thankful for. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, talking to God and supplication with thanksgiving. What I've been doing, which I will teach it sometime in, in, in this year, is I've been doing something I learned from another pastor called tabernacle prayer. And what I've been doing is a matter of state. I've been actually walking through the tabernacle in my prayer time. I enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart and I enter his courts with praise. And I'll lift my hands and I'll say, bless you, God. Thank you, God. I feel nothing. I don't even want to do it. I'm kind of upset about something else. But I say, I begin to talk about who God is, what he's done, how he's made the planet, how he's made the universe, how there's a quadrant, how there's a hundred billion suns by him just saying, let there be. And I'm, I, I begin to pull myself out of myself, thank God. And I begin to get a God perspective on things. And I begin to worship God. I just do it. Why? The Bible says to worship God. And I say, you know, emotions, you're not going to tell me what to do today. I'm going to worship God whether you want to go for the ride or not. We're going for a ride. And I begin to worship God, whether I feel it or not. Because my feelings are not going to control me. The word of God's going to control me. I don't care what you feel. Feelings are important, but not if they supersede the word of God. Is that clear? Thank you very much. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Begin to thank God. No one wants to. Listen, if your kids are complaining, it's hot in here. When are we going to get there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? What do you want to do to your children? I'm not going to say, but what do you want to do to your children when they start doing that? That happened to God. We're driving around with Moses. Are we there yet? And he, a whole generation did not go into the promised land because they were complaining. God does not like complainers. He's fine with you telling what's going on in your life. That's cool. But don't complain. You can say, God, I'm upset. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. God cares about your heart. God cares what you're going through. And then goes, and in Philippians chapter 4, the same chapter, by the way, same book. I went, this is ahead. Okay, this is verse 6, but in verse 4, this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, rejoice! I'm sorry. I, 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 literally, that's what it means. I, actually, I'm actually doing a good job showing what the Greek word means. It means party. It means we're going to off the hook. It means we're having a good old time. Legally. Okay. Rejoice in the Lord always. And just, be, just to make sure we get it. And again, I say, rejoice! Let your gentleness... Be known to all men. Why? How come you're not freaking out? God's got this whole thing. Doesn't mean you don't deal with the situation. Doesn't mean that you don't take responsibility. But it means I'm going to control what I can control. And the rest I'm going to give to God. Easier said than done. Can I hear it? Oh, no. Yeah. I'm going to control what I control and give the rest to God. I wish it was that easy. I understand that. It's difficult. But you've got to continue. That's why we need each other. So. Let your gentleness be known to God. That the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for what? Nothing. But in everything, why well, you keep repeating yourself? Because I want to get it in our heads. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And when you, when you fell down, when you fall down or fell down, go up. That's not very good English, but that's okay. I got your attention. When you fall down, get back up. Remember that commercial. I've fallen, okay, if you've fallen and you can't get up, what do you do? Let me explain what you can do. I heard this story not too long ago, a guy by, by the name of Hanley Page. Hanley Page was an, an explorer, an aviator, born in 1865. He would fly these long flights. He actually became an owner of an airline company and began to make airplanes. And I was reading about a story about him flying one day, and back in those days, this is a more advanced plane, but in the very beginning, they had these horrible planes. I mean, it just, it's so rinky-dinky. And all of a sudden, he heard some noise. He looked around. Behind him, he saw a rat. Now, it wasn't just a little... I mean, I, I think I have rats. You know, these are real rats. I, I, have a lo I had a lawnmower that was destroyed by rats. I start the thing up, and the things are running out of the engine. It scared me half to death. I wanted to blow the thing up. And my wife said, what's the problem? They're mice! She goes, oh, cute. This is this big. No, this is a rat. It's a New York City rat, big thing, okay? He's sitting there trying to fly. And he hears crunch, crunch, crunch. He hears something. He looks around. And he sees a rat. 
He can't do much. He's stuck in his seat. Does not allow him to get out of it, but he sees that if this rat bites those wires, it could lose control of the aircraft and not be able to turn, not be able to use the rudder and what have you and crash. So this is some serious stuff, right? So what he did was this. He began to hit the throttle and he began to climb up higher. He began to climb up higher and higher. The air started getting thin. He started getting lightheaded. Higher. As higher as he could go, he was flying. And it was difficult. And he's, it was hard. It was hard. It was hard to go higher. But he went higher and higher and higher for a period of time. Then he landed the plane. And when he landed the plane, the rat was dead. You know why? The rat can't go higher. It chokes. The enemy can't go in your worship. Amen. You want to mess with the enemy, you start worshiping God. You start giving God the praise he deserves. You start allowing God's word to be bigger than your problems. Don't let the rats begin to nibble on the world events in your life. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Father, that I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. I thank you that I am accepted as if Jesus Christ himself is going before you. I can boldly go before your throne. As far as the east is from the west, you've taken your, our sins from us. Thank you, Father God, that the best is yet to come. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am the head, not the tail. My God shall never leave me until the end of the age. And begin to remind yourself of the truth of God. And those little rats, what they begin to do, they begin to die. The enemy does not like praise. The enemy does not like worship. The enemy does not like the word. The word kills the enemy. That's why when Jesus filled, when he went against the enemy, he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And he climbed higher, and he climbed higher, and he climbed higher, and the enemy had to leave. That's what we have to do. Now, why am I so passionate about this? Because you know what I'm talking about. When you're awakening about 3 o'clock in the morning and you got liquid fear in you, you got to take it by the, by the throat and not play around with it. And tell somebody. Listen, everybody. The enemy does not like the word of God. You keep climbing higher in God and now rats will die. Those varmints will die in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up, please. Be anxious for nothing. But everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to god and the peace of god oh which surpasses all understanding you don't have to take a hit of a drug to get peace false peace once the high comes down guess what happens when you if you get drunk or get high you know what happens when you get come when you come back to the problem is worse when you ignore a problem, you ignore sin, and you leave the sin in the dark, guess what happens? You come back, it's worse. Get it in the light. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will what? Guard your heart. Who guards your heart? The peace of God. Hey, I don't know about you, but I'd rather have God guard my heart than myself, right? I'm going to let the Holy Spirit come in. Guard your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now, finally, like a good preacher, he says, finally, he goes on. He does, that, he does that a lot, by the way. So I'm going to end. He's doing it like a benediction, and he goes on. Okay, so that's biblical. So if I go on, I'm being biblical. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, don't try to stop thinking bad thoughts. Do not try. I can't think about what's going on in the world. I can't think about what's going on in the world. Sometimes the best thing to do is turn off your phone. Okay? Okay. Step, stop trying to do something. Stop, stop resisting. Don't resist, replace. Don't resist, replace. That's how we do it. What we do is we pour more of God in. I want to pour my mind with the scriptures every day. That's why I'm reading every day. Pastor, that's all you talk about. Yeah, I want to tell you right now. It's one of the most powerful things I do every day. Finally, brother, whatever things are true, pour it. Keep pouring it in. Keep pouring in all that junk in your, in your bucket of water, all that mud. You keep pouring fresh water of God's word. Whatever things are true. What things are noble is my TV programs or my Netflix series that I'm binging on. Is it pure? Is it holy? That's between you and God, right? Whatever things are pure, is that pure? Whatever things are lovely, is that lovely? All I have to do is look at my life, my wife, and everything gets better because she's lovely. What I mean that, by the way, she brings me so much peace. I'm so blessed. I love my wife. And next week, we're going to talk about marriage and how you're going to have a great one, even if you're not married, how to have, be happy and single. That's next week. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. Whatever the things are lovely, whatever the things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, 
meditate on these. Mm, that's right. You need to meditate. What does meditate mean? Meditate means think over and over and over and over and over. Meditation is worry. If you don't know how to meditate, yes, you do. When you worry, that's meditation. Well, why not? Think about God at your workplace. I'm going to say a word that might mess you up a little bit, will get your attention. You need to fantasize about God's will being released in your life. I'm fantasizing about the kingdom of heaven transforming my life, my family, the church, and the culture. I want to begin to think with my imagination. God, I want to give you my imagination. Let me think of myself going to work and going into that room with those people that intimidate me and talk negative. And let me see myself say to them, I'm going to see it in my head first. Lord God, I thank you. You give me the strength. And imagine yourself speaking peaceful to your friends. Imagine yourself not going crazy on the baby when it cries or your children. Imagine yourself going home and seeing your spouse say something that normally gets you upset. Imagine yourself saying, thank you, God, that greater is me than my own self. And imagine yourself speaking calmly calmly to your spouse. Imagine yourself handling situations when alcohol or drugs or pornography that comes your way. Imagine yourself in Christ Jesus calling your friends up saying pray for me. Imagine yourself becoming victorious. Why? You begin to imagination, imagination, a meditate, meditate on God's word. I am sure I am well and able to handle this. I can do this in Jesus name. Thank you God when I'm weak you are, I am strong in you and begin to meditate on these things. Meditate on these things, the things which you have learned. That's why we come to church. We learn. It's why we get involved with small groups. Why I encourage you to come to our small group tonight. Freedom. Every believer should go through it. We've decided to open the thing, open it all the way. We invite everybody. Tonight at 7, sorry, tonight at 6 to 7.30. Come. You'll be blessed. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me. See, there's community there. These do, and the God of peace might be with you. It says it will be with you. God's word is true. Let every man be a liar, but God's word is true. So, overcoming anxiety of the unknown. In the unknown, you focus on, on the one who knows all God. To know the unknown will of God, we focus and practice the known will of God. I just share with you today the known will of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for this opportunity to gather here today. Lord, I know that it's difficult what we're going through right now. But Father, I speak the peace of Jesus Christ right now. The love of the Father, the fellowship of the Son, and, and the power of the Holy Spirit upon everyone right now. Father, I pray that we would arrest our fears. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name we'll be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication where we'll make our requests known to you, and you will meet our needs in Jesus' name. Father, I pray right now for peace. Father, I even pray for medical conditions of anxiety, of a depression, I pray for any um, emotional problems in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, you're able to even change the brain chemistry right now in this place. Father, your, your name is greater. You took a crown of thorns upon your head. And Father, I just ask for mental health to be healed in Jesus' name right now. In Jesus' name. If you sense something going on, receive it in Jesus' name. There's no condemnation, but just receive it. Lord, let there be health. Physical health, emotional health in Jesus' name. Heal the brokenhearted in Jesus' name. Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is what we do every single week, everybody. I, I, I know we're going, uh, we have to hurry up because we ran out of parking spaces last service. But uh, let, let me just ask you a question. Have you given your life to Jesus? I'm telling you, it, nothing in this works without Jesus. One day you're going to have to face God. And none of us are worthy of God. All of us are on a collision course to death and separation because we're made by God for God until you get right with God you're not going to be able to enter heaven and so Jesus loves us so much that he died for us that we would not have to die he loves us and he, he extends himself to us and have you really given your life to Jesus you must believe he's the son of God okay that he died on the cross rose from the dead and you must be willing that's not enough by the way to believe he rose from the dead and he's the son of God is not enough you have to be willing to step down from being in charge of your life and give your life to him. If you don't give your life to Jesus, then you're just doing what the devil does. The devil knows he's alive. The devil knows he rose again from the dead. So what? What shakes the change is the surrendering of your life, laying down your life and saying, no longer do I live, but Christ lives in me. And if you've never done that, you're not saved. Maybe you used to walk with God and you're just going the wrong direction. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. As, as those that are watching online as well, if you want to give your life to Christ for the very first time, you've never done it before, 
or you used to walk with God and you frankly don't know where you are in Christ, but you want to get right. Let's see a quick show of hands. You want to get right with God for the first time or make a new commitment. I need to thank anyone else. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, let's just pray this prayer as, as you at home as well. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I give my life to you. It is yours. Thank you, based upon you dying on the cross and rising again from the dead. And thank you, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you that I am now your child. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again. Jesus never says, say a prayer and goodbye. He says, come follow me. In the front pocket of your seat, there are these cards. You want to pull it out. And in the bottom, it says, my prayer, my commitment today. I'll give my life to Christ or I'm renewing my commitment. If you have any prayer concerns, write that in there. As you walk out of here today, there are boxes in the back. You can put what you're offering. If you're online, you can also click or go and text to believe to 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. Before we go, I want to give you an opportunity to give back to what God has done. I'm telling you right now, the Bible will meet all of you. You want to know how to handle difficult times and economic hardships? Trust God. He'll supernaturally meet your needs, not your greeds. And we believe it very strongly here. I've, all my life, I've seen it happen. And so there are four different ways you give. You don't have to give, you get to give. Text Cornerstone Church at 833 245 5660. I'm going so fast, it ain't even worth me saying it. You see it right there. Okay. CornerstoneCheshire.com. And there are boxes in the back. You can also download our Push Pay app. Okay, everybody? Father, bless this offering. I pray that you meet every single need in this place. In Jesus' name, according to your word, amen. May the grace and the peace and the fellowship of the Spirit surround you all with his assurance and love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Be blessed in Jesus' name.